turning things over to our esteemed guest, Mr. Jeff Summers. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for the invite. I appreciate it. Uh, as he said, as I'm sure you all just found out recently, my name is Jeff Summers. Um, and amongst other things, I'm the author of The Electric Church, The uh, Digital Plague, The Eternal Prison, and soon The Terminal State, uh, which is the Avery Cates uh, series of science fiction noir novels. That's how I usually describe them, published by Oracle Books. Uh, so, again, thanks very much for having me. Um, one of the other things that I write is a little zine, so a solo published magazine with Peter Swine. Um, and a couple of years ago, I wrote something that I'm going to read very quickly, which touches on writing and how I got started writing. Um, <coughs> so, let's go there. I trace my desire to write to a pair of head injuries I suffered as a child. <laughs> oh, no, really. The first was when I was very young, and my brother Sean was standing in the back there and was about to insult rather egregiously. So. He's ducky. Um, first was when I was very young, and my brother Sean and I were wrestling in the living room. Sean is three years older than me and possesses that weird sort of superhuman strength previously only found in Bruce Banner. Push Sean too far, and he's like Lenny in a mice and men. He breaks me. That night, he broke me. He tossed me across the room like a sack of marbles, and I cracked my head against the chair and suffered a slight concussion. He's laughing. Savoring the <laughs> The rest of the evening is a get a break. I got my revenge later in the year by causing Sean to sit on a lead pencil in the hopes that he would acquire lead poisoning and die. <laughs> Obviously, I failed, and currently I think I don't regret that, um, such is the progress of my sibling relationship. A few years later, I suffered the second head trauma. In the city, during the summer, the temperatures often reach giddy levels of Salvador Dali-like hallucination, and the inhabitants have traditionally staved off mass death by opening up the fire hydrants and basking in the pools of their water. This usually means a few buildings have to burn to the ground due to the lack of available water, but it's better than milking alive, <laughs> which is no At any rate, one summer, the superintendent of the apartment building across the way had opened up the hydrant to save the children's lives, and I went out to run amok in the water. I was having a great time until my second head trauma. All I remember is looking up in time to see this huge red-headed kid who must have weighed 600 pounds bearing down on me. The next few hours were just a blur. Another concussion, another hospital trip. It was never quite the same. I spent the next few months wandering the house in a bathroom, feeling strangely disconnected and meaningless for a kid. I started smoking cigarettes, drinking heavily. I called a lot of 1-900 porn numbers. When school started again, I dealt some drugs and got into a lot of fist fights. I got that embarrassing Fred Plumstone tattoo on my ass that'll never live down. <laughs> All I can say is that it sounded good at 3 a.m. in Union City after a handful of reds and a six-pack and an evening dancing with samba music and betting heavily on the cockfights. And then one day, I just started writing. Since then, the only thing that has stayed constant in my life is writing. Through various rehabs, blackouts, hospital stays, prison stretches, relationships, and personalities, I've always written. And the one thing I can say for sure about this business of writing is, writers are all fucking crazy. <laughs> Uh, so that's my fanciful way that I started writing. The truth is that when I was a little kid, I taught <coughs> an animated version of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe on television. Right? This was so far back that there were no VCRs either. At least not in my house. Perhaps in NASA they had VCRs back then, but we didn't. No DVRs. Nothing ever got repeated. You'd watch a show in the memory hole forever. Um, and I remember being forced to the library during school one day. Used to take us bodily as a class, would force us to go to the library with a stern warning that you had to take out a book that didn't have pictures. It wasn't about sports. You couldn't just take out Reggie Jackson's biography every time you went. And I was walking around trying to find a book on magic tricks. And I looked up, and there's the line in which the wardrobe, and it had never occurred to me before that uh, source material. I thought they just made this stuff up for TV. And not only that, but there were sequels. There were six other books, and I was stunned. And I just started taking the books out one after the other. They all sat down like for two minutes, bring them back, take them back, again, <laughs> bring them back, take them back. And that's what started me writing, because I was so angry that they ended. And I wanted more, and I started to think, well, I'll just make up my own. And that's, that's where it really started. Uh, the head trauma story is a little bit more exciting than that. Um, <laughs> this eventually led to my first book, which was Lifers, which you will not find anywhere. Uh, you barely find any record of his existence. So I like to carry this around as a totem and say, yes, it did exist. No, we have copies in the mom's <laughs> basement. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you can't by the And that's actually not even a science fiction book, and that was written 15, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the Electric Church I actually wrote when I was very young, 
was about 19 when I wrote the first draft of this novel. Um, and then it sat in a drawer for about 20 years. And so I kept pulling it out and I would tinker with it. I liked the concept, I liked the idea of some of the characters, but it was very, a very immature novel, obviously. Um, I'm not a genius who was, you know, I'm not born a genius, so my early novels were not the greatest in the world. But this had a lot of potential. Um, back in 2004, there was a website started called anotherchapter.com. Their idea was they were going to send out serial fiction through email. So every week you would, you would subscribe to the book, and every week you would get a new chapter. And ideally what they wanted was something more soap opera that would go on indefinitely, where you would just get a continuing adventure of a character or something. But they would accept stories that had definite endings as long as they went on at least novel length. You know, at least, in their parlance, it was 35 to 40 chapters, or 35 to 40 weekly installments. So, more as a challenge than anything else, I dusted this off, and I took their guidelines and started to work on the reworking the novel as a weekly experience. And that's where this version of the Electric Church was born, and they bought it. Um, for, you know, they basically paid me magic beans for it. I never actually got paid anything. Um, but happily, they went out of business for a short time after they bought the novel. Um, the copy editor that they assigned to me was Lilith St. Paul. Um, and she had just gotten a publishing contract with Warner Books. And she was my copy editor, and she loved the book, and she showed it to her editor there and said, you should buy this. And she did. And then she moved forward with books, and here we are today. Um, so that's my little publishing story. <laughs>